Hello, I'd like to in, uh, invite you all to uh, be part of the Wilkes Stoke Academy webinar, uh, which is going to focus on a new era in cardiac monitoring post stroke. Uh, we have four speakers. Uh, uh, Professor Renata Schnabel from uh, Hamburg, Germany, will talk about practical approaches on cardiac monitoring after stroke. Dr. Mirik Alton from uh, Zurich in Switzerland will talk about biomarkers and ACEs detected after stroke. Dr. Jason Andre, uh, University of Montreal, will talk about long term monitoring and AF or AF burden associated stroke risk. Uh, in the general population. And lastly, Professor Luciano Pizzato uh, from London, Ontario, uh, will be talking about risk profile of different AF uh, subtypes and stroke patients. Uh, after the four lectures, we'll have uh, additional panelists joining for uh, discussion and Q&A. Uh, these will be Dr. Lee Schwann from Mass General in Boston, Dr. Michael Hill from the University of Calgary, uh, Professor Ralph Walker uh, from uh, Leipzig, Germany, and Dr. Sally Appeal from University of British Columbia. Uh, please uh, hold your questions until we get to the panel and the Q&A, and I uh, hope you all enjoy this uh, excellent presentation today. And with that, I would like to start with an introduction to talk to you about practical approaches on cardiac monitoring after stroke, in particular for atrial fibrillation. These are my disclosures. So when we talk about atrial fibrillation post-stroke, or you will hear later on, on atrial fibrillation detected after stroke, afters, then we need to understand that there are probably different types of atrial fibrillation. First of all, we can have atrial fibrillation as a causal bystander for this stroke that has just been occurred, or TIA. It can also be neurogenic atrial fibrillation. You know that in particular shortly after stroke, there may be short bouts of atrial fibrillation that are probably induced through the brain. Or maybe in our often older populations, post-stroke or TIA, atrial fibrillation may just be a bystand. And overall, this uh, atrial fibrillation that we find after stroke uh, makes up about 19%. So who should have search for atrial fibrillation? What could be a pragmatic approach? And let's look at the guidelines, and this is the ESC, European Society of Cardiology guidelines, but uh, guidelines around the world are similar. Uh, patients should be uh, screened for stroke for at least 72 hours, and this can be done by short-term ECG recording for at least 24 hours, followed by continuous and ECG monitoring for at least 72 hours whenever possible. And certainly, if you look for atrial fibrillation, you will find atrial fibrillation, and these 72 hours are backed up, in particular, for older studies, which uh, show that um, after 24 hours, you find about 2.6% um, new atrial fibrillation. If you do it for 72 hours, you find an additional 1.8% atrial fibrillation. So this is where the 70 hour, two hours for now come from, and we can discuss later whether extended monitoring and in which cases in particular might make sense. So everybody should have 72 hour mod, uh, monitoring. But if we want to prolong atrial fibrillation surge, um, who should get it? And we see that patients who are diagnosed with atrial fibrillation post-stroke, they are different from patients without atrial fibrillation diagnosed post-stroke. On average, they are older, they are more frequently women, and they often have more cardiovascular comorbidities like chronic lung disease, like heart failure here in particular, 9.4 versus 28.7%, and other cardiovascular comorbidities. So they look different uh, if atrial fibrillation is detected. 
So what could be a practical approach? First of all, um, we have a number of um, devices that are uh, now available for these patients. Of course, telemetry during the uh, um, stay on the stroke unit and halter monitoring during the hospital phase, but also in the post-discharge phase could also be used. But further, there are many more and um, many more new devices that could help us with the search for atrial fibrillation. And it is fairly easy, even in post-stroke patients, to use handheld devices, as you can see in the upper right corner, or more continuous monitoring through or watches, uh, fitness trackers, and perhaps even patch devices or insertable cardiac monitors. But remember that for now, atrial fibrillation diagnosis still requires an ECG of sufficient quality to allow confirmation by a health professional with expertise in ECG rhythm interpretation. And many of these devices uh, only register uh, pulse irregularities, for example, PPG devices that do not immediately display an ECG. And therefore, ECG confirmation is still always is required to diagnose atrial fibrillation. And how could this practically be performed? You have the telemetry, you have the initial ECG um, from the emergency room when admitted to the stroke unit, but then the patient goes on to rehab or after discharge, and here they can be trained to use portable devices, handheld devices, or for longer monitoring, also patch devices or more or less continuous devices and um, insertable cardiac monitors can be used. And if you look for atrial fibrillation, this is a study done by Rolf Wachter, who is present here for discussion later on. If you do a, a repeat monitoring for up to 10 days, um, um, immediately after the stroke, after three and six months, you will find more atrial fibrillation by this enhanced and prolonged monitoring. And if you do it even more continuously, like with external loop recorders over 30 days, like in this per diem study, or, or even use an implantable loop recorder, you will find more atrial fibrillation. Again, 15% in patients with the implanted loop recorder versus 4.7% in the external loop recorder patients. But does this change at present? Does this change our um, therapy, the pathway of the patient? And this is, has been shown by uh, a study, a German study at Charité by uh, Kai Georg Häusler, who performed additional halter ECG monitoring for up to seven days in hospital on the stroke unit. And indeed, when they performed this more intensified monitoring, then they found new atrial fibrillation hazard ratio 1.4. But the main outcome, the primary outcome, the oral anticoagulation 12 months after stroke was not met with an odds ratio of 1.2, but not statistically significant. So we need to see what our intensified search for atrial fibrillation post-stroke really means in practice. And again, back to the study by Rolf Wachter, here he could show, and this study was not at that time, was not powered for this endpoint, but he could show that through enhanced and prolonged monitoring, maybe there was a reduced stroke risk. And he's now running a much larger study that is powered for this important endpoint. And we are looking forward to see the results. But how should we now uh, in practice identify those patients who might merit more intensified prolonged atrial fibrillation search post stroke? And here I would like to quickly introduce uh, one concept, which is atrial cardiomyopathy, which shows um, that cardiovascular dysfunction, like arterial stiffness, but also left ventricular dysfunction, atrial myopathy with many, many factors from endothelial dysfunction to myocyte dysfunction, electrical cardiac remodeling may induce atrial fibrillation, but primarily induces impairment of the left atria. And here atrial fibrillation may be 
just a bystander or maybe also causal in relation to stroke. But most important might be atrial cardiomyopathy. And how can we measure atrial cardiomyopathy? You can do it by echocardiography. You know these old measures like on the left hand side with uh, left atrial measurements like uh, volume or uh, area. But we can also use newer uh, uh, ways to measure it, like tissue Doppler imaging, strain imaging, very promising if performed in a standardized setting, or even use a left atrial process detection, as here seen for MRI, to identify the uh, impaired, the dysfunctional atrium, which may indicate that this patient is prone to atrial fibrillation and that post-stroke atrial fibrillation search may be effective. And before we can go into more detail, again, maybe during the discussion and with the expertise of all the panelists, uh, some clinical characteristics for a summary that um, increase the risk or the likelihood of detecting atrial fibrillation post-stroke, such as older age patients, additional cardiovascular risk factors, in particular heart failure or hypertension, signs of atrial myopathy or left ventricular dysfunction, like left atrial diameter, left ventricular hypertrophy. You will hear more about biomarkers in a second. And also, and the neurologists can say more about this in the stroke etiology and neuroimaging, which may also provide hints at um, the relevance of atrial fibrillation or the effectiveness of atrial fibrillation search. For now, I would like to conclude in the takeaway messages uh, with a practical approach on cardiac monitoring after stroke. Everybody should get an ECG monitoring for 72 hours, telemetry in clinic or continuous ambulatory ECG recording. And if no atrial fibrillation is detected, then we need to reassess the patient if additive non-invasive ECG monitoring based on risk stratification is required. And if we assume that this patient is in a higher risk or a high risk for atrial fibrillation, then we should perform prolonged non-invasive or, um, or even cardiac implantable monitoring, uh, so, uh, so to say invasive ECG monitoring. And you see the timelines, there is not necessarily a hurry, but we can side step after step. And with that, I would like to conclude and hand over to the next speaker. Hello, everybody. Um... It's a pleasure to be part of this session, this webinar, and I'm happy to talk about the role of blood-based biomarkers and AF detection after stroke. And first of all, here are my disclosures. They're not that interesting, though. I think the most important disclosure actually is I'm a big art fan and I'm also a science fiction fan. And therefore, I went out and asked an AI system called DALI what the future would look like if we use biomarkers in stroke and what it would look like if it be painted by Picasso versus Kandinsky. And this is actually the result. So you can choose by yourself which of those images you might prefer. I haven't decided yet. But back to the topic at hand. Most of you attendees obviously know that atrial fibrillation is the most common relevant cardiac arrhythmia in adults. AF is associated with high morbidity and mortality. Specifically, it increases AF stroke risk approximately five-fold. AF attributable stroke risk increases obviously with age. So in the six decades, it's about 1.5%. However, in the ninth, um, it's about 23.5%. AF-related strokes are associated also with increased morbidity and mortality. And as you know, AF accounts for approximately 15% of ischemic strokes. So there is a strong link between atrial fibrillation and stroke. It's highly prevalent and both are dangerous diseases. Moreover, we actually know how to treat patients in the situation where there is an established diagnosis of atrial fibrillation and stroke, these are 
history, uh, trials of oral anticoagulation to prevent stroke recurrence compared to a platelet. So we know that from several studies in the past, and we know that direct oral anticoagulation is superior to vitamin K antagonists if there is no specific contraindication for our oral anticoagulation. So we know how to treat those patients. Um, the thing is, we don't really know in whom we should search for AF after stroke. When should we should start to search for how long and which method we should use. There are more and more methods coming up, how we could identify atrial fibrillation on follow-up. But the most appropriate strategy uh, to detect undiagnosed atrial fibrillation and the prognostic and therapeutic implications of AF detection by different screening methods are yet uncertain. And in this context, biomarkers may help to identify underlying increased cardiomolic stroke risk. And this is, and actually what would be the advantage of blood-based biomarker in this context, we talked about already or heard about imaging markers, but what are the advantages of potential blood-based biomarkers? They can start to be measurable even in the absence of a yet structural change. So there could be biomarkers of vulnerability in a very early stage of the disease where there is no macroscopic change. You could also measure it a bit later on as biomarkers of increased cardiac thrombogenicity in the face of a preclinical substrate for AF or so-called atrial cardiomyopathy, uh, which could be a precursor of atrial fibrillation, but has also shown in recent studies that it might bear an independent increased risk of thrombogenicity and therefore stroke. So biomarkers of these specific levels would be interesting to look at. Now, the process until clinical applications of anything in clinical medicine, it takes time. So of course you have to start to discover and, and, and verify novel markers of interest using, for example, omics and high throughput methods. But then again, you of course need to perform content, but also construct validity studies. And you have to escalate, select candidates and panels for then large derivation cohort studies independent multicenter validation studies looking specifically at these markers. And finally, you need RCTs to really prove if these markers really help to guide, improve um, patient outcome at the end, and hopefully also then finally cost effectiveness study. So as you can see, it takes time, but we are not that far away. So what are um, blood-based biomarkers which have been already associated with atrial fibrillation in the past? So through different discovery, verification, and content and construct validity studies, a plethora of marker have been uh, found to be associated with atrial fibrillation. Uh, markers from the inflammatory pathways, markers of fibrosis, endothelial dysfunction, hypercoagulable stage. But among all these markers, actually, the natriuretic peptides have emerged as those who had shown most reliable results over and over again in different study settings. And that's also why I'm looking and will talk about the natriuretic peptide specifically. So this is a, a, a nice study uh, within Germany of a general population health study, the Gutenberg Health Study. And what you can see here is that two different um, natriuretic peptides have been associated significantly with the identification of atrial fibrillation among this general population, even if you adjust for baseline factors, vascular factors. And what you can appreciate here is also the so-called uh, net reclassification index, meaning that these markers, when you add them to the model, they help in reclassify your patients significantly and with a high mar amount, and they're uh, perform quite similar. So MR pro and P stands for the mid-regional part of the pro A atrial natriuretic peptide, and NT pro B and P stands for the NT terminal part of the pre-brain natriuretic peptide. So these have been shown to be clearly associated with AF in the general population. But we are looking specifically actually at the stroke population. And do these markers, in this case, brain natriuretic peptides, um, do they, uh, are they associated with AFTAS, so AFib diagnosed after stroke? So several studies actually showed a clear association of anti-pro BMP with cardiomolic stroke etiology and even AFTAS. And one of the largest studies included actually 
only ESOS patients stems from the RESPECT ESOS trial. And here you can appreciate the adjusted odds ratio with newly detected atrial fibrillation after stroke was 1.7. However, the problem with these studies is that their optimal cutoff values for detecting AF varied widely across different studies, ranging from 47 to 1,016 picomoles for B and P, and from 110 to 1,745 picomoles for anti pro B and P. And to my knowledge, there is no clear validation study using the same settings, same cutoff, same assay to assess and establish actually clear cutoffs for identifying those patients at highest risk for AFTAS. What about atrial natric peptide? So an atrial, about an atrial natriuretic peptide, as the name says, stems from the atrium. And there seems to be not just an association with cardiomolic stroke and AF, it seems to be also that there could be a causal link to stroke risk and AF. And an association between an N P polymorphism and stroke have been established. And furthermore, um, a frame shift mutation in the gene which encodes for um, ANP was found in patients with familial atrial fibrillation, suggesting this, suggesting this causal link besides the pure association. Now, MRPROMP really was associated among um, the stroke free population of the normous cord with incident cardiombolic stroke. So just not just stroke, but car specifically cardiombolic stroke. Meaning that if you measure MRPRO and P and follow up for several years, if you have a higher level in the fourth quartile, your hazard of having a cardiombolic stroke in the suture is 16 compared to the first quartile, even if you adjust for age and other vascular risk factors. And interestingly also, mid-regional pro and P has been shown to be associated with a AFTAS in, within the stroke population with the quite high odds ratio, even adjusting for several vascular risk factor um, and the odds ratio was 35. Moreover, if you compared the model, including MR pro and P um, to the, for example, JADVASC score, or the ASF5 score, which are used to predict AF, AF risk after stroke, you can appreciate here that the model, including MR Pro MP, improved this decision curve significantly. So, therefore, the author suggests to use MR Pro MP maybe to help at least guide prolonged ECG monitoring with other factors, as we heard, as we heard echo from echocardiography and ECG and so forth. But it might help to guide and allocate resources, healthcare resources, to those who might benefit most. And here, three levels of risk um, situation have been established with these markers. And finally, MR Pro MP was also associated not just with AF on follow up, but also with mice. So, the hard endpoint we want to actually prevent our patients from happening. Here you can see that the distributional hazard ratio. Um, was uh, for maize was 2.0 um, for um, in within one year follow up. And if you, we looked at only the easiest population within the whole cohort, this was even higher with a hazard ratio of 15.9. So based on this studies and several results from the past, there are actually two ongoing um, uh, trials, randomized controlled trials, one in the US, it's the Arcadia study, and one is taking place in Europe. And these are actually the first biomarker guided stroke studies for secondary prevention. In terms of precision medicine, these biomarkers try to select those patients which might benefit most from oral anticoagulation compared to antiplatelet. And we await the results eagerly. Um, yeah, this is actually the final of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to give um, and, and discuss later on these findings so far. And I hand over to the next speaker. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm Jason Andrade. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist, and my portion of the talk today is going to be about atrial fibrillation burden. Uh, so it builds a little bit off of the two things we've already heard, and here are my disclosures. 
And so I, I thought I'd start off uh, a little bit with something I call the ESIS paradox. And uh, this was alluded to in the previous two talks a little bit more. Um, so, you know, we know that atrial fibrillation causes strokes. This is a recent analysis that was published, uh, which is a very elegant analysis of about uh, 450,000 patients with implantable devices, also looking at clinical outcomes. And what they did was match uh, atrial fibrillation episodes prior to a stroke to a period remote from a stroke and look at the odds ratio for experiencing a stroke. Uh, and what they found is that if you had an atrial fibrillation episode lasting longer than 5.5 hours, that was their threshold, uh, you had an over five-fold increased risk of stroke within the next five days. Beyond five days, there did not seem to be any risk. Now, if you dig into the data, the median duration of AF was actually 24 hours. Uh, so it was actually much longer than the 5.5 hour threshold that they pre-specified. But it ties very nicely together to say that having an episode of atrial fibrillation substantially increases the risk of stroke within the next few days. Uh, we know that uh, anticoagulation therapy is very effective at uh, preventing strokes, and so you've seen some of this data earlier, uh, but if you're uh, receiving warfarin, your risk of stroke is reduced about two-thirds from placebo. Uh, if you receive a NOAC, then you gain another 20% reduction over warfarin, so on the whole, about a 70 to 80% reduction compared to placebo. Uh, we know that more monitoring will find more atrial fibrillation, which was discussed in the first talk. So this is uh, an analysis that Dr. Field and I had written uh, almost 10 years ago, but basically just highlighting the incremental diagnostic value of each of these tests uh, as you go from presentation with stroke, so your ECG on arrival, to continuous monitoring, then a 24-hour holder, then a seven-day holder, then an external loop, and finally an ILR. And you can see that for each step, when you add more monitoring, you find more atrial fibrillation, and that's a consistent finding across many randomized trials. But the problem is, is that despite finding more AFib, despite the prescription of anticoagulation, which we know is very effective at reducing the risk of stroke, none of these screening trials have shown that uh, finding atrial fibrillation in the context of a stroke reduces the risk of subsequent stroke. So there's a trend to about a 10% reduction, but even in meta-analyses putting all these trials together, there does not seem to be a significant reduction. So there's a bit of a disconnect there, uh, and we don't necessarily have a great explanation as to why that is, but I can postulate some of that as we go through the presentation. And so I think some of it comes down to just the way that we define things and the types of data that we have. So most of what we know about atrial fibrillation is based on the concept of atrial fibrillation being a binary entity. Either you have atrial fibrillation or you don't. Uh, using that binary uh, descriptor, we know that atrial fibrillation is associated with 142% increased risk of any stroke, a 133% increased risk of ischemic stroke, 46% uh, greater, uh, greater risk of death. Uh, when you have newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation, the mortality is typically uh, elevated substantially, so about 40% within a year uh, in that circumstance. But we are using a very broad instrument. So there's categorizations of different types of atrial fibrillation. Clinically, we'll define it as paroxysmal or persistent. Uh, those are the main differentiators. And where that line in the sand is whether or not the atrial fibrillation lasts for more than seven days or not. If it's less than seven days, we call it paroxysmal. If it's more than seven days, we call it persistent. And using that crude type of metric, uh, you can see that there is a difference uh, that emerges between paroxysmal patients, which have a lower rate of stroke compared to persistent patients or permanent atrial fibrillation. So people, we just leave an atrial fibrillation and make no efforts to get them out. And that helps refine that risk category a little bit better. Uh, very similar findings are observed in mortality. Uh, this data that I'm showing you is from Engage, uh, which you all know very well. Similar data has been shown for each of the NOAC trials. So this gradient of effect, this dose response between the type of atrial fibrillation you have and the clinical outcomes exists. But again, it's a very crude metric. So if we look at something called atrial fibrillation burden, so that's the amount of time that someone spends in atrial fibrillation, you can see that patients who we clinically judge to be paroxysmal and patients who we clinically judge to be persistent, there's a huge overlap in the amount of time someone spends in atrial fibrillation. And so there are circumstances where someone can actually have less atrial fibrillation by being persistent. So if they have one episode in a year that lasts eight days, 
compared to someone who's paroxysmal. So their episodes come and go, but they have lots of paroxysms over the year. And so again, the categorization that we have, it's nice from a qualitative standpoint, but it's just not perfect enough in terms of refining that risk. And so we can use a quantitative characterization, which is using continuous monitoring to define the percent time that someone spends in atrial fibrillation. And that's what we classically call atrial fibrillation burden. Now, in the discussion, if there's time, we can maybe get into how there's various definitions of burden. But I think in its purest sense, burden is a reflection of the amount of time someone is spending in atrial fibrillation. And so by using that metric uh, through continuous monitoring devices, so things like loop recorders, we can see that, again, there is a gradient of effect. So the longer you spend in atrial fibrillation, so as the EF burden increases, uh, this is from the KP rhythm study, you can see that the risk or number of thromboembolic events increases. And so patients who have uh, no atrial fibrillation, they have a little bit of atrial fibrillation, they have moderate amount of atrial fibrillation, then they have a lot of atrial fibrillation, you see that the risk of stroke increases with that. Uh, likewise, uh, different data sets, so this is out of, uh, I believe, Optum Labs, uh, basically showing as the burden increases, the risk of death increases. And so each of these graphs is showing you uh, different metrics for weekly increases in burden. So an increase of 10 to 20 minutes in the top left, all the way to increases greater than 24 hours per week in the bottom right. And you can see that as that happens, there's an increased risk of death that comes along with that. So the more time people spend in atrial fibrillation, the higher the risk of stroke, the higher the risk of death. And then what we've done in our work, is we've actually correlated it back to healthcare utilization as well as symptom status. And so the more time someone spends in atrial fibrillation, the higher the likelihood that they're going to come to hospital for an emergency room visit, for a hospitalization, for a cardioversion, for a procedure. But also using standardized assessment tools, we see that the quality of life linearly decreases compared to the amount of time someone spends in atrial fibrillation. So now in comparison to these binary classifications or these crude clinical classifications, we're actually getting closer to a refinement. And so uh, I saw in the chat, there was a question about using 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation, which is what we uh, use as a standard definition. But the problem with that 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation is that it's never been compared to outcomes. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with symptoms. It doesn't have anything to do with healthcare utilization. So the, the clinical relevance of using 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation isn't great. And as we move from intermittent monitors, like a 24-hour Holter monitor, to more continuous monitors or the use of wearables, 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation all of a sudden doesn't mean anything anymore. And so we find lots of atrial fibrillation that lasts more than 30 seconds when we look at loop recorders, but it doesn't mean that that is the same as someone who has atrial fibrillation on a telethlete ECG. Uh, I would argue that a 10 seconds of atrial fibrillation on ECG is infinitely more important than 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation found on a loop recorder, despite less atrial fibrillation being on an ECG. And so as we think about this from a clinical perspective, we've already heard in the first presentation, there are many different types of monitoring devices available to us. So there's the standard 24-hour Holter monitor or 48-hour Holter monitor that the patient wears and returns and then it's analyzed. There are vent monitors. So these are, are good for patients who have symptoms. Uh, arguably for the post-stroke population, they're completely useless as a test because these patients by definition would have asymptomatic atrial fibrillation. We have external loop recorders. We have patch monitors, uh, which are the newer versions of those. And then there's uh, mobile cardiac telemetry, which is either real-time monitored or not. Um, each have their advantages and their disadvantages. The problem is they're very insensitive. So if you were to take one test uh, for each of these different durations of monitoring, you can see that a 24-hour Holter monitor in a population of patients who are known to have atrial fibrillation will only find the atrial fibrillation 10% of the time when applied once. And so if we think about the post-stroke population, uh, you know, the pre-test probability versus the post-test uh, is a little bit questionable when we're using these shorter-term monitors. If we get all the way up to a 14-day monitor, a single 14-day monitor has a sensitivity of about 45%. And so it's just probably not good enough when applied uh, for a population where we're trying to find atrial fibrillation. 
But that lack of sensitivity also is a huge problem when we're trying to transition from binary endpoints into burden endpoints because it just misses too much atrial fibrillation. And so this is an older paper um, from Charitos et al., who basically went back and looked and said, you know, if you're using intermittent monitors, you really can't call something burden. So you can't look at how much atrial fibrillation is on a Holter monitor and say, well, that's the burden of atrial fibrillation that they have, because the reality is you're missing 90% of the atrial fibrillation when you do that type of test. And so when you compare these intermittent monitors to implantable monitors, uh, you can see basically those four different test durations, like I showed on the previous slide, starting with a 24-hour monitor up in the top left, seven day in the top right, uh, 48 hours in the bottom left, and 14 days in the bottom right. And so the longer you monitor, uh, the more atrial fibrillation you'll find. But paradoxically, the lower the burden of atrial fibrillation that exists in the population that you see. And so in the 24-hour monitors, despite missing most of the atrial fibrillation, if you happened to find it, you've basically selected out the patients who have more underlying burden. But the problem is you're grossly overestimating the burden because of the imprecision of the test. Whereas when you get out to three 14-day monitors, your burden estimate comes much closer to truth. But now the burden of atrial fibrillation and those where you're detecting atrial fibrillation is actually quite low. And so as we try to get to you know, a more refined sense of how to define atrial fibrillation in terms of how much atrial fibrillation uh, people have, the continuous monitors are definitely going to give us a closer assessment of the truth but it also requires us to rethink a little bit how we conceive the idea of atrial fibrillation and reevaluate those thresholds and where clinical relevance is. Because 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation on a loop recorder versus 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation on an external loop recorder versus 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation on a Holter monitor are actually reflecting three different amounts of atrial fibrillation despite using the same diagnostic threshold solely on the way that we found the atrial fibrillation. And so to wrap up my portion of the presentation, I just want to say atrial fibrillation burden is a closer estimate of the truth. It's quantitative. It gives us more precise estimates of what's happening. But to define or detect an atrial fibrillation burden, you really need to have a continuous cardiac monitor. Anytime we're using intermittent monitors, we're just not going to get an accurate assessment of uh, atrial fibrillation burden, and therefore it's going to color how we interpret the data. Uh, we know that atrial fibrillation burden is a reflection of truth, and therefore it's linearly related to quality of life, uh, healthcare utilization, and based on the Korean data, stroke. Uh, the problem is that we're not at a point yet where we know what the burden that requires intervention is. And so based on some of the data, it may be 0.1%. On other data, it may be 5%. We just haven't uh, seen this data uh, realm mature enough to be able to make treatment decisions. And so thank you uh, for my part of the presentation. I look forward to uh, answering any questions that come up. Thank you, Jason. Um, Mira and Renette for, for the great talks. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay. So um, my, um, my part of the talk is related to AF burden, specifically in stroke patients. What we heard um, just a few minutes ago from Dr. Andrade was AF burden in the general population. So these are my disclosures. And the three topics that I'm going to address today um, is where are we at uh, in, in terms of prolonged cardiac monitoring and AF burden, which are the differences between AF detected before and after stroke, and what are um, what is the, the the current knowledge in terms of AF burden in stroke patients. So, in terms of of cardiac monitoring, we have seen. Um, the landmark trials, Crystal AF and Embrace, after those trials, there has been a more um, in, um, consistent recommendation of uh, suggesting that all patients with stroke or at least a, a large proportion should undergo uh, prolonged cardiac monitoring. And then that's, that has resulted in, a, um, in an uptake of prolonged cardiac monitoring um, in most parts of the world. 
um, there is a, a modeling suggesting that if we if we applied uh, implantable loop recorders or cardiac monitors to every single patient who do not have known AF before the stroke, we will diagnose 1.3 to 1.5 million uh, new AFs per year uh, globally. So, so this is a, a, an important topic that affects a, a large proportion of stroke patients. So what are the differences between AF known before and after stroke? And first of all, I would like to say that all that we know, or most of what we know about AFib in 2023 20, uh, is based on ECG-based diagnosis. The risk or the five-fold um, higher risk of stroke related to AFib comes from uh, population-based studies like Framingham, for example, in which all the diagnoses were made based on ECGs and mostly in, pa in people or patients or participants who had symptoms related to their AFib. And all that we know in terms of, of secondary stroke prevention or primary stroke prevention in patients with AFib comes from trials that were that were really great trials, but published many, many years ago in which uh, all the patients included were ECG-based uh, diagnosis and um, and most of the secondary prevention strategies that we use in 2023, or some of them were not available in those years. So the problem now is that we are we are trying to um, draw conclusions from these studies to apply them in, into um, e into AFib detected on 14-day holders or or 30-day holders or loop recorders on up to three to point or 4.5 years of of implantable loop recorders, and and the problem with that is that whatever uh, evidence we have collected in the last 10 years shows that these um, ECG-based AFibs are quite different from the, uh, from the prolonged cardiac monitoring detected atrial fibrillation. And uh, this is a, a meta-analysis in which we looked at each of these variables independently in, um, um, by performing a systematic search and meta-analysis. And when we did a meta-analysis for each of them, and what we found is that for patients with um, with newly diagnosed AF or AFDAS after stroke, compared to those who had AFib before the stroke, uh, the patients with a new diagnosis of AFib after the stroke had a lower prevalence of hypertension and diabetes, as you can see here. But most importantly, they had a much lower prevalence of cardiovascular comorbidities, as you can see. 50% uh, lower prevalence of CAD or coronary artery disease, um, uh, uh, lower frequency of a prior myocardial infarction, lower prevalence of, of heart failure, peripheral artery disease, or and even in previous stroke. Of course, when uh, putting all this together and looking at the um, at the cardiac structural changes, patients with AFDAS or atrial fibrillation detected after stroke had a, a higher left ventricular fraction on average and had a lower or a smaller left atrial area, which means that these patients overall had a lower chest vest score. And when looking at the uh, independent association on in those studies that were included in the meta-analysis in terms of the risk of recurrent stroke, patients with newly diagnosed AF or AFDAS had a lower stroke recurrence by 26%, which was uh, significant. So. We're facing a problem here in which we are trying to um, to understand AFib diagnosed on devices or, or prolonged cardiac monitoring as we did in the past for ECG-based diagnosis, and, and that is a problem. For that same reason, we suggested a few years ago to um, start calling these atrial fibrillations AFDAS or atrial fibrillation detected after stroke because they are specifically diagnosed after stroke in, in, um, in, um, in stroke or TAA patients. Uh, they could be prevalent, but they were not diagnosed in the past, or they could be incident, meaning that the, the uh, onset is truly after the stroke. So uh, by using this term, we, we, could, um, we can be more precise in terms of how we understand, how we investigate, and how we uh, treat these, these patients. Professor and perhaps... Apologies. One of... if, sorry for interrupting. If you can swap the displays, the slide will be shown a bit bigger. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thank you. So, um, so in terms of of um, of what are the consequences of those differences between known AF and AFDAS is that when analyzing uh, in another run in another systematic review and meta analysis 
when analyzing the uh, the uh, impact of prolonged cardiac monitoring in randomized controlled trials on different stroke outcomes, stroke recurrence outcomes, we found that, um, of course, using more prolonged cardiac monitoring is associated with in increased use of anticoagulants, but there, there was no effect on stroke recurrence rates. In other words, using more prolonged cardiac monitoring did not or was not associated with a reduction in stroke recurrence rates. And this was also found in other studies that I will show you again um, in, a new, in another slide. But the most important thing that I would like to say about this is that none of these trials were designed to show a reduction in recurrent stroke risk, which means that most of them were likely underpowered. And even if we put all the studies in a meta-analysis together, uh, it doesn't mean that we will reach a, a, a a large number um, of patients enough to prove that PCM or pro prolonged cardiac monitoring is associated with uh, lower stroke recurrence rates. As I told you before, another meta-analysis uh, uh, done by other authors showed similar results, no significant association between prolonged cardiac monitoring and stroke recurrence in clinical trials, but they did find some association in observational studies and when they put everything together, there was a, a, a reduction in stroke recurrence rates. And the, another explanation for, uh, for the uh, lack of association between PCM and, and stroke recurrence rate is that when, when people have different degrees of, of AFib burden, the uh, impact of different modalities of, of cardiac monitoring may um, result in higher or lower re recurrence rates. For example, here, for someone who has a very high burden AFib, any investigation will end up finding the AFib, and that would not be um, a problem. For those patients who develop very short-lasted episodes of AFib after the stroke with no prior history, uh, if we do just an ECG, we may uh, miss that opportunity of diagnosing the AFib. If we do a 14-day holder, we might be able to to see some um, AFib depending on when we started. And then if we do an implantable loop recorder, it would be much more likely to find that short lasted episode of AFib. Um, and for those patients who develop AFib many weeks or, or, or months after the stroke, uh, for sure an ECG done during admission will miss it. And uh, for a 10-day holder or 30-day holder will miss it too. Whereas um, a, a more um, intense monitoring strategy with an implantable loop recorder will probably find it without any difficulties. So if we see at the, if, if we look at the, the patterns of AFib that each of these modalities can diagnose, and this was also very nicely shown um, in the uh, paper by um, Dr. Andrade that he showed you before, uh, with ILRs, we can, we can find all sorts of atrial fibrillation, very high risk and very low burden that might not even be related to the stroke onset. So what do we know ex exactly or specifically in terms of AFib in patients with, uh, with stroke? When looking at data from the ACERT trial, we can see that patients that had AFib before the stroke, what, what, um, what this bar means is that um, this is the period in which patients were monitored um, the vertical line is when they had the stroke. So here we have pre and post cardiac monitoring. And um, in patients who exclusively have known AF or AF before stroke onset, you can see that the burden was relatively high. However, in those patients who had only AFib after the stroke, there was no AFib before the stroke happened. The, the burden of AFib is pretty, pretty low, as you can see here in this uh, chart. And when analyzing different patterns of AFib in patients uh, from ACERT, IMPACT, and TRENDS trials, there are three main, uh, th three main patterns of presentation of AF burden in stroke patients. One of them is the one that happens before the stroke. These are patients who um, had AFib before the stroke, and then when they have continuous monitoring after the stroke, it is very easily identified because it's very high burden. For stroke neurologists or, or stroke physicians tr treating stroke patients, we usually do not see this. We don't. We ignore this part. And then for neurogenic patients, uh, for um, there is another pattern in which the AFib occurs only immediately after the stroke, and it's very short-lasted, and it never happens again. And then we have another pattern in which AFib happens many, many months or weeks after the stroke, and then uh, it has a very low burden and does not progress to high burden. 
And this is important because also based on results from the ASSERT trial, uh, they, they very nicely showed that only AFibs lasting more than 24 hours were really associated with high uh, risk of stroke or systemic embolism. So the main findings from, uh, from uh, these studies are that there is no temporal relationship between the stroke and the AFib uh, occurrence. AFib burden is associated with, with stroke risk. So the higher the burden, the higher the risk. And there seems to be a, a very significant threshold over the uh, 24 hour duration. And if we apply this to patients with stroke, this is another very nice study uh, by Sagris and colleagues in which they looked at patients who uh, were diagnosed with AFib during admission, and then some of them never converted back to sinus rhythm. Some of them did convert back to sinus rhythm, and some of them never, uh, and some of them just uh, terminated the AFib um, spontaneously. And interestingly, what they saw here is that the 10 years uh, risk of stroke recurrence was significantly higher in those patients who never converted to AF compared to those who went back to sinus rhythm. And that brings this brings us to what happens in the general population. And these are, uh, these are um, data from, from the LOOP trial in which they very nicely show that uh, AFib is a progressive disease. So these are patients from the general population that were diagnosed with AFib with an implantable loop recorder. And you can see here the trajectory of AFib burden throughout the ensuing months after the, the first AFib diagnosis. Some of them progress to have a higher burden of AFib. Some of them progress, but mildly, and some of them do never experience another episode of atrial fibrillation during the follow-up. So these are the numbers for each of the three main patterns that they identified. Only 16% of those patients um, uh, were um, show, showed a, a progression uh, over the threshold of 24-hour duration. Uh, most of them progressed, but did not reach that threshold during the follow-up, maybe because it was not too long or it was not long enough. And 22% of those patients, and this is important for us, um, did never ex experience a recurrent episode of atrial fibrillation during the follow-up period. So. If we bring that uh, this back to stroke patients, it might be possible that just because we're monitoring them so intensely, we're finding some episodes of atrial fibrillation that do not that are not significantly associated with a high risk of stroke. And the challenge from now on is to identify those patients and know exactly which ones will need to be treated with anticoagulants because they they went beyond the threshold of 24 hours, or maybe because they have other risk factors such as atrial cardiopathy, age, or other vascular risk factors. Some other patients, uh, we may probably don't know if they really need anticoagulants, and we will have to uh, have a close follow-up of them. And then some other patients who never progress to um, AFib or long-term AFib, uh, these patients may just require a very close follow-up of their AFib burden and the evolution of their risk factors and atrial cardiopathy parameters. So to summarize, AFDAS is a very heterogeneous group. There are high risk and low risk patients based on AF burden and other uh, markers. Um, in, most, in some cases, it might be too low burden to justify anticoagulation. We're not there yet. We still have to identify those patients. Um, we need to... Uh, um, better understand what the burden means in, in the context of atrial cardiopathy and other risk factors. And the future steps are to develop scores or maybe characterization of patients or, or after phenotypes that will allow us to identify the ones that uh, will most likely benefit from anticoagulation or even from long-term monitoring. So before we, we go to the um, to the discussion, I would like to mention that there will we will be distributing a survey, an AF survey that we would appreciate if you could respond to. Uh, we will show this later before the end of the session. But if you want to scan this with your cell phones, uh, it will um, take it will bring you to the to the web page where the survey is. So I'm going to stop here, and I will invite all the uh, the um, um, the panel discussion members so that uh, we can start a live discussion. And I'm going to try to connect with uh, Dr. Fisher in the meantime. So while I, I do that, I, I will start by um, welcoming everybody. And you have been already introduced. And I will start with the, with the first question, which is um, in the loop study, uh, 
looking for AFib with an implantable loop recorder and then initiating anticoagulation for any episodes lasting more than, more than six minutes did not significantly reduce the risk of stroke or systemic arterial embolism compared to standard of care. I will invite anyone um, to um, respond to that question. Thank you. Well, Luciano, I'm happy to, to, to take a crack at this. And, and uh, I'm uh, Dr. Lee Schwamm from the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. I think, excuse me, several of the speakers did a really nice job of pointing out that this is a very confounded definition, right? It's not like we're doing a uh, you know, CAT scan at one day and a CAT scan at seven days and a CAT scan at two weeks. We're really uh, applying a definition which is highly con contingent on, for example, you know, what makes AF symptomatic? Well, it's symptomatic if you have clinical symptoms while you're awake at a time when you're trying to do something and you discover uh, a limitation, either shortness of breath, you know, tachycardia, whatever it is. But that's different than the frequency and the burden of underlying AF. Obviously, as the burden goes up, the likelihood of detection by, by an uh, individual EKG goes up, but it also likely implies that the person's been in sustained AFib for some period of time for the symptoms to actually manifest. So I think we have a lot of confounding related to that. I think we have confounding based on prior uh, indication and medication use. Patients who have known AFib are more often on anticoagulation by definition than patients with newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation. So I think where I, my big takeaway from, from all this work is we really need randomized designs that look at treatment allocation as part of the protocol and randomize these patients to oral anticoagulation versus, you know, antiplatelet therapy or some combination of the two, trying to, to extract confident knowledge about the impact of treatment in this population, I think is very challenging. We often don't know why patients who have AF detected by device don't get anticoagulated. We don't have good data on what other confounding is driving those treatment indications. Um, and I think there's an opportunity with the work that um, I think it was Mira was presenting with biomarkers to ask the question, do those biomarkers look different in patients with community detected AF who have not had a recent stroke versus right after the stroke um, to get at this question of, is this lead time bias? We're just picking the AFib up earlier and it's the same AFib. It's just gonna progress over time till it hits a threshold at which point we're gonna need to treat or is it truly a kind of peri-infarct expression and, and therefore doesn't require long-term treatment. Most of the literature I think that I've read suggests that once you start to fibrillate, your future is more fibrillation and eventually you're gonna cross the threshold. So the real question is, are the studies have of long enough duration? And do we have enough confidence that the control arm is, is truly without fibrillation uh, to be confident? So it's a lot of answers to that question, but it's a, I think it's very confounding. Problem, so I'm gonna, take over here. Um, so next question we have is, how do we differentiate neurogenic AFib from causal AFib? Does any, anybody want to tackle that? I, I can. Okay. I was looking for volunteers, but I, I, I can tackle them. So, so it looks like, um, uh, there, there's not a question. There, there's not an answer to that question right now. We, 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 there's. It's absolutely impossible to know which AFibs were triggered by by a neurogenic mechanism and, and which ones were pre-existing. There might be some hints. One of them would be patients, young patients with totally normal hearts without a left atrial enlargement, with normal left ventricular function, no risk factors, and a big insular stroke presenting with symptoms uh, suggestive of, of autonomic dysfunction. Right. That would be the typical neurogenic patients, but that's very uncommon. We don't see that commonly. And, and clinically, I don't think we have an answer. Yeah, you know, Luciano, I think when I started, there was this big distinction. 
There was this provoked AFib that you could ignore. And then there was the real AFib. And, you know, so if you got AFib with sepsis, if you got AFib with, you know, your, um, I don't know, thyrotoxicosis, if you got AFib with all, and if you had surgery, you had AFib, it was, oh, that's not real AFib. And one by one, those myths have been, have been uh, knocked down. So I think with the exception of the group you just mentioned, which is, again, like peri-insular with a storm of autonomic functions, dysfunction surrounding it, I'm just not convinced that these that these are different forms of fibrillation. I think these are just different thresholds of expression of fibrillation and what stressor will bring out the fibrillation varies by individual. So I'm, I'm much less keen to dismiss this. Now, I think we probably should hear from the cardiologists in the group, because again, I have, uh, you know, sort of exposure and selection bias, observation bias. I don't see all the patients with AFib who never have a stroke. I see the ones who've had an event. So obviously I'm very biased towards the association between those. Um, and we do have to think about the potential harm of chronic anticoagulation, but, but I'm very leery of the idea that we have seven different forms of AFib. I think we have different rates of expression and detection um, and symptom expression. So uh, do any cardiologists want to comment? I will, um, and then uh, Renata as well. Um, but. I, I think that they're not different. They're just different points on the same spectrum, right? So we know that atrial fibrillation is a chronic progressive disease. It starts probably with subclinical AFib that eventually progresses to clinical, that eventually progresses to persistent, and then eventually into uh, permanent. And so I think that uh, to the previous question, it's kind of the canary in the coal mine when we find it. But I don't know that we necessarily need to throw everything at it at that point. It's the question of when does it matter? And so, you know, the example uh, that I find most telling for this is a cert. So if we look at a cert as published in New England in 2012, that told us that six minutes of atrial fibrillation was associated with a 2.5 increase, 2.5 fold increased risk of having a stroke. But the way they defined that was how much atrial fibrillation was present during the first few months of monitoring on a pacemaker. And that was it, is how you were found right now defined you for the rest of the study. And the reality is, is that when they went back and reanalyzed the data, the amount of atrial fibrillation that you have to have for it to matter is 24 hours of continuous AFib. And almost immediately after having that, you see that the rates of stroke shoot up. And everyone else, it didn't matter. You could have no AFib, you could have five minutes, you could have six hours, it really didn't matter. So this, this latter reanalysis by Van Gelder very much highlighted where it became important. And so if you only look at a snapshot in time, so say someone has a stroke and you monitor them for two weeks and use that data to define them for the next 10 years, sure, it may highlight that some people are in the increased risk category, it just doesn't tell you when they're going to cross that threshold to needing an intervention and needing something done. And so I think that that piece is part of the reason why um, all of these studies have sort of failed to take it to that next step in terms of the clinical outcomes, because we're potentially jumping at noise in the system or way too early when we don't have enough lead time. Um, the only other thing I wanted to bring up is the idea of symptoms. Um, so East AFNet, which is a, a well-known uh, study within the cardiology literature, was uh, published two years ago. And so East took people with newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation, randomized them to rhythm control or rate control, and then followed them for 5.1 years. And so East showed that newly found atrial fibrillation, there was significant reduction in cardiovascular death, significant reduction in stroke with rhythm control. So highlighting that keeping people out of atrial fibrillation prevented adverse cardiovascular outcomes. This is the first big randomized study to show that. Uh, but the interesting thing is symptoms had no bearing on that outcome. So if you were asymptomatic, if you were moderately symptomatic, if you were severely symptomatic, none of that changed. And again, it speaks to the idea that atrial fibrillation is the problem leading to those adverse outcomes and aggressively managing the atrial fibrillation improves those outcomes. Uh, symptoms are not something that modulate that.
So maybe I guess Renata, do you want anything to add? That's fine. We need, we have several other questions. But, so uh, the next question but Mark, is are 30 seconds from the guideline. We can no longer hear Mark because I think Professor Spazato is muted. Luciana, why don't you read that question? Yeah. And the stroke patient that you would actually recommend. And I Mark, I'm sorry, but it looks like they can't hear you well. So uh, I, I'm going to read the the answer, the question again. Are 30 seconds from the guidelines absolute or in high risk? I'm sorry, 30 seconds from the guidelines absolute or in a high risk patient would a 10 to 15 seconds of AFib run surface? Who wants to answer that? Thalia, you had your hand up or uh, Rolf? Yes, so uh, I, I can answer this. So um, the 30 seconds means by uh, monitoring that is something like uh, a few days or so. That is the 30 seconds threshold. There has never been a randomized trial showing that 30 sec uh, 35 seconds is more risky than 25 seconds. That is just a convenient measure. And we have to be pretty clear that even in the large anticoagulation trial, there is only a minority of patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and nearly nobody has only one episode of, let's say a minute or two minutes. So we don't have data on how to treat these patients. The other possibility is to have an ECG, just a surface ECG. If you have atrial fibrillation on the whole surface ECG, which is just 10 seconds, that is enough because we had to have a lot of data from Framingham from randomized trials that these patients should be anticoagulated. If we have episodes shorter than 30 seconds, 10 or 15 seconds, we are in an area where we absolutely have no data. And I would be very, uh, I would not recommend to anticoagulate these patients because there is, we, we even struggle with episodes longer than 30, 30 seconds, but we should not start to anticoagulate patients who have episodes of 10 to 15 seconds. Luciana, can, can you all hear me now? Can you hear Mark now? Yes. So as a corollary question to the group, what burden of AFib or duration of AFib would you not anticoagulate after a stroke? Jason, you, you have your hand up. Do you want to take that question? Uh, no, I can defer to Renata for this one. Okay. I was going to add something for the previous one, but... Yeah, it truly depends on what uh, situation you find these 10 seconds as Rolf Achter outlined. Um, a 12 lead ECG is also less um, than 12 seconds. And if you find ECG uh, atrial fibrillation on this, you would certainly anticoagulate. And I must say, I hardly know a neurologist um, who identifies atrial fibrillation post-stroke and would not anticoagulate um, those individuals. So we do not have the evidence for that. Um, if you run sure and do really have a prolonged monitoring and it really needs to be um, longer and you need to try to define a burden. And if you really think it's very low burden, that means continuous monitoring and then only 10 or 15 seconds, then you can think about it. And usually in primary prevention, we would also uh, try to account for additional risk factors for stroke. Uh, uh, you can use the chats West score, which combines several of those like heart failure, age, and other stroke risk factors, um, and then decide on uh, anticoagulation. However, post-stroke, you're in a co completely different situation because you have had an event that may indicate a potential re uh, causal relationship, and therefore the threshold to anticoagulate is much lower. And therefore, I think it's an individual decision in these uh, patients. And I actually, although the guidelines currently say it needs to be set 30 seconds, which is good, this is a moving target and maybe um, it will be different in a couple of years. Talia, you, you, you would like to comment? Talia, would you like to comment? Sorry. For oh, sure. And sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I think 
I think the challenge is we're trying to interpret, you know, data that's probably been derived from a very heterogeneous patient population. And that's why we're not seeing, I think, the signals that we expect with, you know, the intervention that may be, you know, triggered by detecting AFib. I think the challenge right now, and I think one thing that we're going to have to think about with, you know, future randomized trials is, is the, you know, not just kind of how we detect the AFib and the burden, which of course will kind of modify risk, but also kind of the individual patient characteristics. I mean, I think we're often kind of chasing the stroke they had, you know, was it kind of, do we think it was maybe cardioembolic or not? But I think, you know, we also have to think about, you know, in terms of risk stratification, the stroke that they may have in the future, you know, what their individual risk factor profile is. I think the other challenge too is like, you know, your, your risk benefit calculus is going to be modified by what intervention there is. I mean, we're kind of thinking of anticoagulation and, you know, this two thirds risk reduction, you know, there may be other antithrombotics that, you know, come into play for AFib treatment in the future. And, you know, of course, we're also, you know, becoming increasingly interested in, in rhythm control as, as stroke neurologists. And of course, kind of our, our threshold for action, in addition to kind of your patient risk profile is going to depend on what the, uh, risk profile is of your potential intervention. Thank you, Thalia. Uh, Mira, Lee, and then Michael, please. Yeah, so I think one of the important things is that a fib burden is actually overlapping with overall vascular burden, and it's quite difficult to disentangle it. But if we can identify those with the highest a fib overall vascular burden, which is associated with risk of recurrence, because that's actually what we're looking for if we want to dis select those patients we want to treat to reduce that risk. That would be ideal, and and um, and I think that you know imaging and biomarkers and blood biomarkers may really help us in in selecting those patients with the highest risk of underlying um, thromboembolic risk overall. Excellent. Lee? Yeah, I just want to emphasize what I think is a really important shift in the conversation, which is away from Sherlock Holmes with the magnifying glass trying to prove the cause of the last stroke to thinking about what is the best strategy for preventing the next stroke. And I want to remind us about two things. One, patients have multiple risk factors. The next stroke in the patient with uh, de device-detected AFib might be a small vessel occlusion. Right, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it matters to prevent cardioembolic stroke because of the morbidity and mortality associated with those strokes. But we may also need to be thinking about combined strategies to reduce risk of all forms of stroke, not just the cardioembolic contribution. Um, and then the, the second thing is, um, we've gotten a lot of uh, feedback and dialogue about the stroke AF trial, where we detected device, detected AFib in a manner very similar to crystal in patients who thought to have uh, large artery or small vessel occlusion. And people are very quick in, in many cases to dismiss that as neurogenic or, you know, it's trivial, it's not the enough AFib, it's not the right AFib. And yet those same people, if it was a cryptogenic embolism and they find a brief episode of AFib, they're completely convinced and they start anticoagulation. I would say if we're going to be skeptical about this AFib presence burden, et cetera, we should apply that across the board not preconditioned by our assumption that there must be fibrillation in the cryptogenic population. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, I'm just gonna add uh, in in the per diem study, which was the parallel to, to Lee's study from Boston, um, we've now done some longer term follow-up and we don't have all the data in yet, but there are a huge number of longer term outcome events, three years out, in terms of recurrent AFib, uh, recurrent strokes, people dying for other reasons, lots of vascular events. And so the, again, to reiterate the concept that we're evolving from an idea of binary thinking about atrial fibrillation to perhaps a more continuous thinking, and then more importantly, thinking about overall risk. Um, one of the things we did in per diem, which was perhaps a little bit different from others, was we included people regardless of what their cause of stroke was. Even if they had a lacunar stroke, we included them and we found AFib, right? So, you know, I, I, the, 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 this concept that it's that it's, uh, it's just an overall marker of risk is, an, is a really important one. Uh, Rolf, 
Yes, um, um, I want to add two things. So one is I, I totally agree with the concept we have to look forward and we have to uh, take in mind that usually for, we know from registry data that if somebody has a recurrent stroke, there is a shift in about 50% of the stroke etiology. So I really promote this concept. And we have seen this in the uh, Find AF randomized trial where we did 10-day um, hold to ECGs that regardless of the stroke was cryptogenic or was um, was lacuna, the AF detection was pretty similar. So it, it's not like only in the cryptogenic stroke patients we find higher burdens of AF. The second point I want to make is, um, should we treat atrial fibrillation detected by a device that is lower than 24 hours? That is a question that is currently answered in two randomized trials. One is with apixaban and one is with edoxaban. It's not so much stroke patients, it's 90%, 95% are non-stroke patients. But we and, and one is ongoing, that is a teaser, and the other one, that is Afnet NOAA 6, has been stopped prematurely because there was no benefit of anticoagulation in comparison to aspirin or, or placebo in three, uh, 2,500 patients. And there was actually harm with more bleedings. So we cannot translate this into the stroke populations, but it just tells us that maybe we should not treat all short episodes of AF in non-stroke patients. And in my opinion, this and uh, this opens the door to say we should probably do a randomized trial in patients who have atrial fibrillation episodes lasting less than 24 hours and randomize them to anticoagulation or aspirin because the answer is open. You mean stroke patients, right, Rolf? Or, or, yes, uh, oh, yes okay. stroke patients, stroke patients. I mean stroke patients. Michael, did you have other comments? I see your hand up. Your hand is up. Sorry, Luciano, that was just a residual one. Okay, great. So I think we are uh, beyond the time that was uh, scheduled for uh, for um, the webinar. I don't know if anyone has anything else to say, any anything to wrap up. Otherwise, uh, we I, I see there are lots of questions yet that we were not able to answer. I, you can interact with the World Stroke Organization Twitter handle or any of our Twitter handles to ask the questions. Um, and I invite you again to um, to reply to the or answer the survey. It's a very short survey, six, seven minutes, and it will help inform um, other uh, clinical trials, the design of other clinical trials. I would also like to um, say um, goodbye and thank you um, on behalf of Dr. Mark Fisher, who had some technical problems and, and was not able to connect properly today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also.